Hello everyone. In this presentation, I will be giving you a brief eye view of my dissertation titled Music and Image, the soundtrack of Manuel Conde's extant films, 1941 to 1958. Manuel Conde, the filmmaker. Manuel Conde or Manuel Pabustan Urbano created the 1950 film Genghis Khan that brought honor to the Philippine cinema in the Venice Film Festival held at the Palazzo del Cinema the following year. The same film was exhibited at the Edinburgh Film Festival in 1953. Conde was an all-around filmmaker as director, actor, screenwriter, and producer. In 2006, he was posthumously awarded the Order of National Artists of the Philippines in film. Background of the study. Soundtrack cues refer to each individual music piece in the soundtrack. This may be a theme or a background music that serves as a marker of a setting or a scene. It may also be instrumental to recall a past event or sometimes an anticipation of what will occur. Cues acting as narrator is the central thesis of the dissertation. This I refer to as an actant or the sonic entity of a motion picture taking the form of a character or presenter in the diegesis of Manuel Conde's excellent films. For this reason, music cues are construed as narrative agents of film diegesis. Moreover, music cues support the focalization of characters and events in the story. Filmmakers deliberately focalize visually and sonically what they intend for the spectators to experience. Focalization is where important messages of the narrative are coded to be decoded by the spectator's lens. In formulating my framework, I examined studies of several scholars, theorists, and critics who conducted studies in film, semiotics, narrative agency, multimedia, and film social discourse. Framework. There are two theories that I have considered in framing the theoretical problem of this study. First is narrative theory, which pertains to the narrator of the film, and second, semiotics, which deals with the various meanings in dialogues, visuals, and sound. Take note that narratology and semiology are inseparable in this study. Narratology identifies the various narrators of the selected motion pictures, while semiology examines the text of the narrative of the films, thus utilized in the study as well. Implying narratology and semiology in the analysis of Conde cinema unfolds construed meanings or subliminal messages visually and sonically. The specific local framework that I formulated to analyze the study is the concept of the Philippine word larawan. Larawan as a noun refers to an image in the form of a picture, a photograph, and a portrait. As a verb, it takes the form to describe or ilarawan. This ushers in the notion of spectator's gaze to see what is not visible or vague to the eyes. To reckon, Bartz's take on photographic paradox is vital in this study. The analogous photo in the frame of a photograph is not the total depiction of the subject. A spectator would always infer from his recollection of experiences to appreciate and understand what he is gazing at. Larawan, in the same respect, is an inquiry of the sociocultural experiences of the spectators and associating the spectator self to the character and events in the digest of a film, he goes beyond the boundaries of the silver screen or any viewing apparatus to subliminally inquire about what the eyes and the ears experience in the cinema. Paglalarawan is the act of recreating an experience that is presented by a narrating agent beyond the frames of a picture, an event, or anything that has a story to tell. Therefore, the concept of Larawan has a framework would be used in the context of the narrator's description of moving pictures in which the music track equally serves as the narrator of Conde's films. I posit that cues, no matter how short, faint, or monotonic, are vital. Hence, they must be scrutinized and understood as part of a whole. Moreover, film soundtrack as sonic narrator should include every cue in the analysis to fully understand the multimedia. As seen in figure A, there are four conceptual sides or borders to Larawan or picture in a narrative film. One side deals with the film a narrative which was created or produced due to the other sides. Another side or aspect is the material, whether for business or personal vocation. Film producers cannot produce films without capital and technology. With support from film viewers, financial success is achievable. Another inseparable aspect in film is its social impact. The spectator's social milieu affects the outcome of films. 
commercial film producers create cinema, which they think would be a success. They listen to the various social classes and produce films for those intended paying audiences. Aesthetics is another aspect of film production. This may be referred to as the power of the cinema. When aesthetics is the main focus, the quality of films produced would result in higher standards. The Rawan is divided into two parts, moving image and soundtrack. The imaginary line that divides it into these parts signify that the two coexist in the frame and not literally separated as left and right. The moving image refers to everything that pertains to the visuals of the film, while the soundtrack concerns the sonic aspect of a film. In figure B, the left and right parts of Larawan further divide into characters, diegetic location, music track or cues, and soundtrack. The imaginary line also signifies that even if the two main parts of the film were divided, they all coexist and happen simultaneously in the diegesis and not literally divided into four separate planes. My classification of actors in this study is a character referring to the individuals in the diegesis, while non-human actors I refer to as actants. An actant is not necessarily a person in the film. Actant is designated to the music cues, taking the role of a character in the entire dissertation. Here's a clip from Genghis Khan. Apparently, in the clip, other objects are needed due to the enmity or the absence of spoken dialogue between Tamujin and the enemy soldiers. The non-living things that Tamujin used as weapons are enhanced with sound. Other objects act as quasi-characters. They are co-present inanimate objects in the diegesis taking the role of actants. The non-diegetic music cue outlines Tamujin's actions with a melodic line played alternately by a contrabass and a cello. However, as boulders and loose rocks fall on the enemies, the sound of a bass drum rumbles. This is a literal sound icon of the rolling rocks that hinder Tamujin's chasers. The throbbing of boulders and rocks continues and is represented by the duo between a bass line and a bass drum. Both instruments produce a deep and massive sound. Tamujin may visually be alone in defending himself, but the presence of the sonic quasi-characters or insentient actants contributes to the balance of actants, both objects and individuals in the scene. Moving on, the diegetic location is the locus of the events taking place in the diegesis of the film. Music track consists of musical cues, while soundtrack referred to as noise on track that contains the rest of the sound heard in the diegesis. The need to differentiate between music and noise is necessary because in this study, only the music track was analyzed. The entire soundtrack can be classified as diegetic, non-diegetic, or quasi-diegetic. Diegetic music, according to Claudia Gorman, is music that apparently issues from a source within the narrative. These are the sounds heard by the characters in the diegesis as well as the film spectators. Non-diegetic music, or sound, on the other hand, is the extrinsic sounds, or musics. These cannot be heard by the characters or actants in the diegesis. Quasi-diegetic, according to Jared Levinson, is when the music can be brought to be audible in the world of the story because it is fictionally grounded in an observable source, but not in the precise form heard by the viewer in respect of volume, instrumentation, or performance quality. 
Among the four conceptual aspects of a film, there is always one which is focalized by the director. The side of the conceptual aspect that is the most important for the scene will get the focus on the diegesis. Before we move on to the next figure, I classify the sounds in the soundtrack into three dimensions. The first dimension is based on the parameter of whether the sound is in the represented scene or outside of the scene. Thus, sounds heard are classified as diegetic, quasi-diegetic, and non-diegetic. The second dimension is based on the parameter of whether the sound is heard internally by the characters only or by both the characters and spectators. And the third dimension is based on the parameter of whether the sound is heard by a single character or two or more, hence the term collective. In the diagram, the boxes correspond to the relationship of the various dimensions. On the one hand, an intrinsic sound can never be done diegetic because the sound is heard by the characters in the diegesis. This explains why the box is shaded. The third column shows that intrinsic sound is always heard by the characters in the film. The extrinsic sound, on the other hand, can never be diegetic since the sound is intended for the spectators of the film and not for the characters in the diegesis. An extrinsic sound is an always non-diegetic. However, intrinsic and extrinsic dimensions are both heard in quasi-diegetic. In addition, the relationship of the third dimension to the first and second determines the number of listeners of the sound. Both single and two or more characters hear diegetic and quasi-diegetic sounds. However, the term collective only applies to the group of two or more characters hearing the source of sound. The relationship of the three dimensions would be read as, for example, collective intrinsic diegetic or collective extrinsic quasi-diegetic sounds, referring to the sounds heard by two or more characters. Going back to the discussion on the Lorawan figures in figure C, focalization is directed as circle, what spectators hear and see in the film is not the entirety of the diegesis. However, the filmmaker directs the spectators to move vital information for comprehension and experience. Thus, various elements of the film are orchestrated to specifically direct spectators' focal points throughout the course of the film. In Abbott's words, focalization refers specifically to the lens through which we see characters and events in the narrative. Aside from visual focalization, the sound is also widely used. According to Bordwell and Thompson, filmmakers often use sound to shift our attention, though combining various sonic elements. The four conceptual aspects, the two sides of the frame and the focalization combined results to a one conceptual framework is shown in figure D. Figure D shows the conceptual framework that's utilized in the study. Consequently, the outer side of the frame deals with the conception of narrative films, which are created as a combination of the four aspects. Diegesis, because there is a story to tell. Material, because producing films is seen and considered a material endeavor. Social, because in one way or another, films are influenced by the film viewers and spectators of various classes according to their taste of film genres. And aesthetics, because filmmakers showcase their artistry and their creations. The inner space of the field is divided into two main parts, the moving picture and the soundtrack. The moving picture contains the actants and the location of actants in the diegesis, while the soundtrack is divided into patterns, sound or music, and contingent noise. The circle of focalization the frame denotes that not everything in the diegesis could be visibly seen nor heard. The Rowan or image may not literally depict what it shows. Bartz's argument on the frames of a photograph in which a spectator infers from his past experiences in order to give meaning to the image seen in the photograph resonates soundly in this framework. In this sense, the boundaries of the physical frame of a photograph is disregarded by the spectators as he subliminally infers with his experience. The paradox that two messages happen at the same time cannot be debunked as explained above. That is, one message denoting the exact copy of the subject and another, the connoted message that associates the spectator to the image. In addition, according to Vergara, distortion of reality operates at a more insidious and unseen level than mere physical retouching. Despite its perceived objectivity, the photograph is no simple open text. Free to any possible reading, it is actually rather restricted, embedded with the ideology that produced it. A viewer of a photograph then 
may interpret what he sees according to distorted knowledge about the subject. Misinterpretation and reinterpretation may occur without the proper guidance of the narration in motion pictures and narration in the form of text and soundtrack. It is then the job of the director to focus visually and sonically the necessary elements and or subjects for the spectator's comprehension of the films exhibited. Nevertheless, an in-depth reading may result to added meanings by the spectators beyond what the director had given. Thank you.